Season 9 of Night School is presented by the AQHA. Watch and wager on the Los Alamitos Championship Sunday, October 13th. Keeneland Select, live racing Wednesday through Sunday at Keeneland. Visit KeenelandSelect.com and earn a $150 sign-up bonus. Live racing all weekend long at Woodbine and Woodbine Mohawk Park, Patterson Canadian International Day, Saturday, October 12th. Remington Park, live racing Thursday through Sunday, Oklahoma Classics Night, Friday, October 18th. And ExpressBet, fund your account for free and get free past performances at Express. Bet.com. Just like people, horses have off days, and by looking at them before they actually get on the racetrack, you get an initial impression of which way they're leaning. This is going to sound crazy, but for me, it's intellectual stimulation. Class is now in session. It's time for night school. Here are your hosts. Welcome in, Night Schoolers, Season 9 of the National Online Fan Education Program. I'm Jeremy Plunk from Horse Player Now. Tonight, we go on a trip, many trips, as we talk trip handicapping with Brian W. Spencer, GM of Horse Player Now. Brian, what a long, strange trip it is to be a handicapper, but when it comes to trip handicapping, it's at least a place where your opinion can be way different than everybody else's, the eye and the beholder. Yeah, and we've got a lot of things in horse racing that are very subjective, you know, when we watch races and we when, when we handicap in advance of races. But trip handicapping has got to be one of the single most subjective factors in all of racing. We can watch the same race and come away with completely different opinions about how, you know, a minor instance of trouble may have affected a horse or uh, how many lengths that trouble cost a horse. Um, I think this is kind of the one episode on season nine where it's OK if you listen through it and you come out on the other end not fully having all the answers because this is one that you kind of have to develop on your own but what we want to do here tonight is basically give some examples of some trips the kind of things you can start to look for and uh, then hopefully you can kind of build your own ability to watch the races and look for the kind of trouble that works for you Go to our YouTube page, youtube.com slash horseplayer now. Several videos on trip handicapping, which will go along great with this podcast as we talk you through it is wonderful. But to see it for yourself and our video explanations from a few years back in the night school program, they will be of great assistance to you. So again, youtube.com slash horseplayer now. Hundreds of videos, about a million downloads of those videos over the years. We know the fans have loved them. Go back to them, check them out, uh, refresh your memory, go down memory lane, and those trip handicapping handicapping videos, visual handicapping videos, things like that are just much better to see uh, and go back and rewind and take a look at. So take advantage of those resources. Also take advantage of the resources presented to you in the racing industry. If you're a horse player in this day and age, chances are you have an ADW, an online wagering account. Almost all of those services offer free race replays. A lot of racetracks at their websites will have replays of their past shows. YouTube pages for racetracks also have them. If you play California Racing calracing.com has replays available for the Southern California and Northern California racetracks. So there are plenty of resources out there where you can get race replays and get into this trip handicapping. Brian, when it comes to trip handicapping, are there particular things that are signal points for you that send you to looking at race replays? Or are you simply looking at race replays in every race that you handicap? Uh, it, it, it certainly depends. Uh, you know, if we're talking about a specific meet, say fairgrounds in the winter, I'm watching every race every day and going back and watching every race again because that's my bread and butter meat of the season uh, of the year, rather. But generally speaking, let's say I'm handicapping a Saratoga card. The replays I want to go back and watch are second-time starters, horses who have only been out once because, uh, you know, an even fifth-place effort for a debuting two-year-old can look very different in a lot of different ways. So I always want to go back and look at those debut runs. And also, if you get into those company lines and you see you've got, you know, two or three races you can go look at where two, three, four of the horses have run against each other before, go watch those and see how they stack up to each other tactically, where they position themselves with one another. And you can kind of get an idea. You know, you don't, I don't think you have to watch every horse's last replay all the time, but those are the spots where I definitely want to jump in is when you've got a common running line where you can get a lot of information on multiple horses at once or when you've got lightly raised 
Eclipse courses and you really want to see what they were able to do. Were they goofing around? How green were they? Things like that in uh, in those race replays for second time starters. Watching replays and trip handicapping can add more than just that two dimensional short comment that you see in the past performances. You know, blocked rally that sort of thing that you see in the past performances. Those are all done by an official chart caller, and a, a chart caller usually has a sidekick with him, a two man crew at most racetracks around America. Now, back when I was calling charts in the nineties for Equibase, I was a one man crew calling the race in the binoculars into a tape recorder and then going back and watching replay after replay after replay for the next 10-15 minutes between races uh, making the comments on each horse. It really taught me to study the races. It made me a better handicapper and I think it was at that point when I discovered that trip handicapping really has a place. You know, <laughs> I don't want to date myself but the early days of trip handicapping you'd go to a racetrack and it was almost like a peep show. You would you would show up in a booth and there would be TV monitors there and you'd have to <laughs> yell at somebody on a, on a telephone to tell them what VHS tape to pop in and which race you wanted to go back and watch. Times have gotten a lot more uh, technologically <laughs> advanced since those days. But, you know, it used to be a struggle to be a trip handicapper. And again, in the 90s, when it was part of my job, I understood, look, this really does have some benefit. I think my handicapping probably moved up 10, 15 percent uh, in those years when I was ch- uh, being a chart caller and watching every race so close and going back and watching every replay so many times. But I know this, I could only give you two or three words on the short comment, and that doesn't always summarize exactly what happened in a race. It can also set up some red flags for people where the trouble line is there, and everyone just looks at the trouble line and says, you know, blocked, nowhere to go, and, and, and they just, well, well, if this horse had somewhere to go, he would have won the race. That's not the assumption you should make. When you see a trouble line in the past performances, you should go back and look at those. That's a good time. Brian talked about common opponents, you know, horse is running back against each other. Good time. Second time starter. Good time to watch the replays. But anytime there's a trouble line, go see it for yourself and determine how much that trouble really cost the horse. Did it cost him a placing? Did it cost him a couple lengths? Did it cost him victory in the race? That's what you really want to go back and not make an assumption just based on the trouble comment. Another thing about chart callers, I'll give you a little inside scoop on this, and I know this to be fact. If a horse was one of the favorites in the race and got into some trouble, you're going to see that in the comment line. If a horse was 15, 20 to 1 and got into some trouble, a lot of times that is omitted from the uh, comment line. There are a lot of chart callers in the country that think that their comments are really affecting the way people look at the race and and making assumptions. That blocked in the stretch means that horse would have won had he not been blocked in the stretch. If they think that 15 or 20 to 1 shot wasn't any good to start with, they won't put the comment in there. You might just see no impact or something along those lines. So if you go back and watch race replays for yourself – I promise you, you are going to find a lot more trouble for long shot horses that was never recorded as part of the short comment. That's a way where you can get yourself a huge price. When you see some inexplicable horses who ran six last time, beating eight lengths at 18 to 1, with no visible excuse in the running line, go back and watch the video. And if you see a visible excuse in the running line, that's how you get that horse back at 30 to 1 today. And maybe they run a good second, a good third for your exact as a try, or maybe even upset and win the race. But again, horses who who are favored, who get in the slightest bit of trouble, you're going to see a comment line for it almost every single time. It's one of my pet peeves, and I loathe it, but I know for a fact that it happens and something that you got to keep an eye on in trip handicapping. Brian, so when you go and you look at these videos and you're going back and you're making notes on horses, what are the types of bad trips that you're looking to bet back next time? Well, you know, and touching on to those short comment lines, I think uh, it's to me, it's sort of a pet peeve, but it can be kind of your best friend or your worst enemy. You know, if if you're watching, if you're putting in the work and you're watching race replays and doing your own trip notes, if a chart caller sees the same thing you do, then boom, everybody else gets to see it, too. But if you can find a trip note, some trouble of some sort that a chart caller did not see. And as Jeremy mentioned, a lot of times that's going to be on a price horse. That's the one you put in your pocket because people don't get that information for free in their past performances they've got to do the work themselves so uh, those company lines can be, uh, you know, in- important. But also, like you said, go back and watch the replays. How many times do you see something that says, you know, blocked quarter pole to eighth pole? And you go back and you look and the horse is just one paced, you know, just wasn't actually in trouble, things like that. But 
A couple of the main trips, I think, um, because I'm looking to find those hidden trips. I'm looking to find the trips that aren't going to show up in those comment lines. One of my favorite ones is, uh, you know, looking how horses feel. Are they looking comfortable? You can, I know you can look at the fractions and you can say, oh, they went 23 and 2 on the front end. But if the horse wasn't doing it easily – that could be a very quick pace for the horse. It could be a pressured pace rather than quick on the clock. So I think uh, those are the kind of things you can see if a horse is looking happy, if a horse is moving smoothly. Uh, horses who, I know this is one of your big ones too, we talked about it before, the break slow, rush up, and fade trip. So great when they break clean the next time out. That's one of my favorite ones too. But uh, generally speaking, uh, kind of looking for the visuals of how horses are doing. It's not always as easy as just, oh, he got blocked. Oh, he checked it's more those hidden sort of nuance trips that i think are the ones that i'm after these days yeah and watch head movement and and that's a major part when brian talks about how is a horse traveling or are they comfortable or are they stressed head movement you want that head to be nice and steady and and into the bit but not side to side and moving and fighting and and giving the jockey something to work at uh, that's certainly a visual point you want to look at in these trips one of the things as a chart caller i really noticed was the impact of the first turn on two turns race horses who lose ground on the first turn lose it with absolutely no benefit it is just strictly ground loss and they have to run faster to overcome that ground loss on the second turn wide on the second turn could be a good thing because this is where everybody in the race is is fading on the front end and you could get blocked in behind horses and you could get stuck behind a tired horse being wide on the second turn can be good just to keep your momentum yes you had to run a little farther but you went uninhibited and you had good solid momentum around the second turn there is nothing beneficial at all about going wide on the first turn it is strictly ground loss it's like track and field you're going you're going to hit the back stretch further behind the horses who were on the inside it's just geometry and so horses who lose ground on the first turn you rarely see it marked in the past performances most of your trip notes will tell you that they were wide six wide at the top of the stretch six wide quarter pole whatever but on the first turn that's the problem spot so look for horses who were wide on the first turn and then maybe were a little flat in the stretch now they draw a better post position this time around uh Horses who are doing the dirty work are horses I like to bet back. The dirty work, I say, is a horse who's sitting second or third who has to make the first move into a speed horse. Some horse is out on a loose lead, and somebody's got to go get them to try to quicken the pace up, or else they know they're just going to be chasing a carousel around the racetrack. That horse who does the dirty work rarely wins the race. He sets it up for somebody else. But if the race shape sets up differently the next time around, he's not behind just a single speed horse. That's a horse whose last race you can just draw a line through. And if the previous races match up with today's field, you've got a great excuse to toss out a horse who had to do all the dirty work. That first run into a lone speed horse, again, is a really bad situation to be in. And another place I think is really bad for horses to be in is racing between horses throughout. If you see horses three wide across the track, the one in the middle of those two rarely ever runs the best race that is a stressful position for the horses to be in and between horses throughout those horses rarely run their best race again bet them back the next time they'll probably run better and again to get that same trip again is not likely the way this race might set up today as it did the last time but one thing with horses who tend to get in trouble brian they tend to repeat themselves to get in trouble because they're not fast enough to get in and out of spots one problem i think trip handicappers make is a horse had a bad trip so i'm going to give him an excuse and act like this will never happen again if you've seen a horse get into trouble two or three times in the last eight races on their past performances it's probably because they don't have gear and they can't get in and out of bad spots. So repeat trouble horses tend to just keep finding it. Yeah, and I think that that's something. I mean, you know, horses who who are not fast enough to be near the front, uh, you know, or just, as you said, to kind of accelerate in and out of spots, get into that trouble. And another uh, sort of move that I've really been looking for over the, and it's really kind of worked great for me over the course of quite a few years is uh, in cheap horses. Now, Andy Serling would probably disagree with me uh, because he says there are no trips in slow races. And generally speaking, uh, I agree. You know, you can't make something out of right nothing. Part but of the time. <laughs> that's I mean, all of us are. But fair enough. But yeah, one of my favorite, absolute favorite angles to take a trip note on is a lightly raced horse. You know, it doesn't have to be first time starter, second time starter. We can be four or five races into the career, but a young, cheap horse who makes a middle move in a maiden claiming race. A lot of times that's kind of the first sign of a light bulb going on as a horse who hasn't done much. Then they finally make that menacing move around the three eighths to the three sixteenths. 
and then they flatten out. A lot of times, that is the hint that they're going to sustain that run in the next start or two. That has worked really well for me in those cheap Louisiana bread races at fairgrounds, and I think it's a fairly effective strategy, too, uh, if you're trying to get an idea that a horse lightly raced, maybe not very talented, is finally starting to put it all together. Time for us to take a time out on Night School. When we come back, Kate and Bradar will join us. But before then, we go to the Night School Vault with John Doyle, winner of the DRF NTRA National Handicapping Championship and curator of the Optics EQ Trip Handicapping Service. John will talk trips in between. And then comes Kate. We'll be right back. cheer on live racing from Woodbine and Mohawk Park. Thoroughbred and Harness Action. The wagers are just the beginning. Watch award-winning broadcasts covering both breeds. Incredible battles contested over the most unique grass course in North America. Experience the full fields with over 130 Thoroughbred and 160 Live Harness Days. Get access to free handicapping material and join the ranks of Woodbine and Mohawk Park players from Strategize, Analyze, Select. Join Keeneland Select to bet on racing from around the world on your computer, tablet, or smartphone, anytime, anywhere. Featuring the best rewards in racing, free pass performances, live video, race replays, and more. Plus, Keeneland Select invests a portion of its profits back into the sport. Join Keeneland Select today and earn a $150 sign-up bonus at KeenelandSelect.com. Dedicated to the sport and dedicated to the players. Folks like to bet on the horses. Some like to bet on the games. Some folks like to bet on their phone. And some like to bet from their suite. So what's your best bet? All of the above. No matter how you like to bet, Remington Park is your best bet yet. With world-class horse racing, OKC's newest casino and online suite booking now available. Remington Park, it's your best bet yet. Hey, what's going on? Mikey here, and I'm going to tell you about an offer from my good friends at Express Bet. Let's be honest. We know you love playing the races, but you can't always make it to the track. Sometimes life just gets in the way of a good bet. Well, what if I told you about a place where you never miss a bet and you start with house money? You'd say I'm crazy, right? Well, not at Express Bet. Your first $100 are on them. That's right. Sign up with ExpressBet.com using promo code XBRADIO, bet 100 bucks, and they'll deposit 100 bucks back into your account the very next day. Hey, plus you could get an extra 25 bucks if you use Express Fund Direct Deposit. You see what I mean? House money for betting the races. It's that easy. Check it out at ExpressBet.com to learn more. And don't forget to sign up for promo code XBRADIO. You're gonna love it. And that's a Mikey guarantee. Must be 18 years or older and 21 years old in certain states to open an account with Express Bet and reside in a state where such activity is legal. Void or prohibited. National Gambling Support Line 800 522 4700. Welcome back to the show. Enjoy this classic night school clip from the vault. If you do this enough, like we've done, we I think we have 80 some thousand uh, trip notes in our database right now. If, if you do this enough, you start identifying areas where, you, you know, like areas. Like, for instance, you know, uh, I think sometimes with younger horses, developing horses, three-year-olds, you know, even two-year-olds, but, you know, three-year-olds and horses that are developing, especially on the turf. I know we were talking about the turf before. The thing is, is, you know, sometimes speed figures can be really misleading in that area, right, because these horses can improve leaps and bounds. And people will say, oh, my goodness, I can't believe this horse moved up and, you know, fire points or whatever speed figure you're using, right? And the trips help you identify those types of things because, you, you know, you can see it, right? You can see, you know, you, you can kind of, like I said, if you're following this stuff, if you're looking at trainer intent and, you know, along with, you know, the way the horse is kind of doing things and, you know, different things like trouble but also, you know, horses that maybe need more distance, right? And, you know, again, to go back on this whole thing about being prepared, you know, because if you're not prepared, let's say a trip that you would interpret, and it looks like the horse kind of runs out of gas in the stretch. could be a turf race, right, and even a dirt race. You, know, you can interpret that three different ways. The horse needed the race, right? Um, you know, the horse needs a short distance, or the horse just has no grit, Right? But if you don't have that context, it's very difficult to, you know, to make, to make those assertions unless you really got the context. 
So that's why it's important to kind of look at these races and it's, it's it, you, know, you know, ahead of time to maybe understand. And if you keep a good set of notes, then you really do less. You, have to do, you don't have to do as much handicapping because the handicapping actually is the trip handicapping. Right? It really is. And I talk to people who follow circuits, right? If people that have really been really good over years and they follow circuits, it's because they get that nuance. They understand. They watch the trips and they have an edge. Yeah, and you're right, Steve. It can't. It just doesn't translate to automatic. You got to know how to wage. You get there's other right. It's just, it's just this makes it a great game because you have to have all these different types of skills, right? And so, so it doesn't automatically translate. But if you want to identify races and horses um, that are going to connect at prices, I, I think this is this is the method, the, the only method, really, not the only method, but the, the, the most. I think the the method most likely to to do that for you. Joined, as always, by Kate and Bradar to close out the show as we finish our discussion on trip handicapping. This one, um, like a lot of things in handicapping, definitely more of an art than a science. People watch races, the same race, and they come away with different things. So it's always interesting to see uh, how seasoned players use trip handicapping to their advantage. And we're going to bring in Kate and Bradar, who's had uh, plenty of experience using trip handicapping and also has some decent tips on what to look for when you're trying to watch horse races. We, you know, Brian, this is, I really do think this is the one thing that everybody can get better at and can make or break your handicapping. And it's, um, it is more art than science. But what's important in trip handicapping is watching all the circumstances that are contributing to or are happening over the course of the race that may or may not have contributed to the outcome. And, and that's the key. And, I mean, sometimes you'll see a horse's momentum stop. But if if it really didn't happen in a critical part of the race, or if the horse didn't really have the talent or the ability, um, then it doesn't even matter, right? So I think that the mistake people can make constantly is um, a very easy one to make, which is the minute you see trouble, assuming that that made the difference between winning and losing for the horse. Um, the other thing, and this is something that I, I kind of picked up in, in – Doug, my husband, working with Florent Giroux and getting to have some conversations with him about trip and race flow and, and kind of what I should be watching for when I'm watching horses run is Florent Giroux said that the, you know, the ease with which a horse, at the point at which a horse has an opportunity to relax is critical, that no horse or very few horses can, can run all out or can, if they're cranked up, if they're rank in the early stages of the race, even if they have a perfect trip or even if the times are great, if the horse isn't able to relax and catch their breath at some point during the race, then it, it's going to cost them at the finish. And, you know, that, so I'm watching to see how relaxed a horse is, or is there an opportunity or a moment when the horse gets to shut off just a little bit so that they can get a second win, quite literally, to have something left for the finish. And the horses that, you know, sometimes maybe because of trip, maybe because horses had them boxed in, um, that aren't able to get that, but maybe with different circumstances, a different rider, a different distance, um, a different venue, those horses may be great opportunities to play the next time they run. And I, you know, I, so I'm always watching as much as I'm watching a trip, I'm watching to see how the horse is handling the trip or what they're doing in the course of the race. Great example of this was Mr. Money in the Pennsylvania Derby, um, who was a horse I liked a lot, but if, if you watched, he, bro he broke sharply. He had been training very aggressively and more on the muscle. So the big question was, um, you know, for me at least, if he was going to ever have that opportunity to relax in the race. And he was able to make the lead and set very slow fractions, which most people, when they watched him get beat at the finish, said, well, it was wrong. He didn't have an excuse because the times were so slow. He was crawling on the front. He should have had more than enough left at the finish. But I didn't feel good from the even without looking at the clock from the very beginning of the race, because he, he dragged Gabe Sias out of the gate. His head was up in the air. He was wrestling with the bit in his mouth. He wasn't comfortable going into the first turn and he really didn't settle until down the back stretch. And even when he did settle at that point to me, it was too late. Um, he was, he was always kind of up on the bridle and, and 
anxious, almost waiting for the horses to come at him versus a horse who was able to settle in the early part of the race, kind of catch their breath. And I thought even if he had run a little bit faster, pace wasn't the thing that cost him. It was in terms of his ability to turn it off at some point. I think that's what really cost him the race at the very end of it. And maybe there were some other factors that contributed to him getting beat. But at the end of the day, the most important thing to me was, was, was he settled? Did he get to catch his breath? And, you know, that to me is as big a part of trip handicapping as the actual trip itself, what part of the racetrack and whether they were um, stopped at any point. Yeah, and I think that is a perfect example. They went 24 and 2, 49 and 3 to the half mile. And you would think, as Caden said, no excuses from there for Mr. Money, but it's how he was doing it. And that's something you can really only get from watching the races closely and incorporating trip handicapping into your overall handicapping process. This is going to do it for tonight. We'll be back next week with an episode on the psychology of a horse player. FAQ 60. Trip handicapping. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And American quarter horse handicappers know it's the fastest way to get there. When races are decided by hundredths or thousandths of a second, trip handicapping is magnified so much more than when playing thoroughbreds. Here are the keys to trip handicapping. One, the start. You want your horse's head straight, looking down the track. Two, you need a clean exit from the gate. Three, maintain a straight path. Don't waste energy and time drifting in or out. And four, your horse needs to outrun rivals to avoid trouble. Speed is what you need to avoid others. Head-on replays are critical tools in your pursuit of finding trip handicapping gems. This FAQ 60 is brought to you by AQHA Racing and Horse Player Now. Enjoy tonight's episode? Check out hundreds of past archives at horseplayernow.com.